Okay, so let's just do a quick recap of what we uh, did yesterday. So basically what we did was we looked at uh, So, uh, okay, so simple means basically it's much simpler than real uh, physical systems, but already it, uh, they're difficult, you can't solve them exactly, so it's simple in some sense. Uh, so this is basically what I call the ON models. Where the Hamiltonian of the system is given by something like SI bars are vectors, uh, and uh, this uh, basically the uh, I mean, so I line not equal to J, and uh, this uh, IJs are basically sites on our some d dimensional lattice. So it could be like uh, I take a lattice and at each side there's a spin. Uh, and uh, so this is site I and this is site J. I mean uh, alternatively what I can say is that I is equivalent to let's say some vector which uh, gives the position of this site, right? So I need the D, vector, uh, D components to specify each point. So I is uh, equivalent to NJ is J bar. And, uh, uh, and this J is like each spin int can interact with uh, uh, like various spins. And I said like if you uh, look at the interaction between this spin and this spin, uh, so there's a, dis I mean the di interaction uh, Interaction strength is uh, like decays with the distance. So it's let's say some power of uh, some power, uh, not n, but some. Where b should be sufficiently large so that I can call it short range. And uh, so later we'll see what, how large it should be. Uh, but basically it should be so large that uh, if I look at this integral, J, then uh, this should converge, okay, so this should be finite. Okay, so this is necessary for example even for the free energy to be extensive and so on. So, I, okay, so the other thing I should mention is that uh, I'll choose the J so that there's translational invariance in the system, which means that uh, the interaction strength between, let's say, this guy and this guy is the same between this guy and this guy and this guy. And so it just depends on the relative uh, distance between I and J. So this vector, uh, this strength J. So this means it's a, sh a short range interaction. And the other thing is that uh, J X I bar X J bar uh, depends only on the relative distance between these points. So that so that's corresponds to translational invariance in the system. Okay, it's clear, right? So how can I, like, uh, is it easy to change uh, this translational invariance? What's the simplest way I can break this translational invariance? Huh? Okay, boundary, if there are, if it's not periodic, okay, so right now I'm measuring periodic boundary conditions, let's say, uh, what else can I do to break the, 
disorder. So how external field? Uh, so does that break translational invariance? Let's say I put a field in some direction. Let's say the z direction. Uh, Non-uniform rate. So if I put a let's say a field h i uh, at every point which is different, then of course when I translate it, it's different. Right? The energy would change. So that would break translation. If I put a random magnetic field. Okay, so uh, right now we are not talking about such systems. We are talking about translational invariant system. The other important thing that uh, you should remember is that this, uh, this Hamiltonian has some symmetries. Uh, so one, uh, and we said that uh, uh, as you change the symmetry, uh, as you change the temperature, the symmetry gets uh, like broken. So, the, so what is the symmetry of this Hamiltonian, which is kind of like, uh, other than this translation invariance constant, what are the symmetry? Uh, Z2 is, uh, sorry? Uh, okay, so that is for Ising models, if you, uh, if you flip all the spins, the energy obviously won't change, right? Because, uh, I mean, if you flip all spins, the sign of this guy doesn't change. But if you have Heisenberg spins, is there some other symmetry? Rotational symmetry, right? If you rotate all spins by the same amount, then obviously the, I mean, the, this is dot product doesn't change. So, uh, so this has some symmetry. Uh, and uh, what we said is that, uh, in, like you have, uh, these models can have phase transitions where you get into a state where the state, the new, the state doesn't show this symmetry. So like if you have, uh, if you find that you have a spontaneous magnetization, Obviously, it's not invariant under when you rotate uh, the spin. So, uh, Yeah, the, uh, and I said that you should be careful about these two dimensionalities. I mean, uh, you can have a 1D lattice, and on each side you can have a Heisenberg spin, right? So you can have a three dimensional vector sitting at each side. Okay, so these vectors have three components, but they are sitting on a uh, 1D lattice. So this is uh, d equal to 1, n equal to 3. We have some vectors uh, which can be pointing in three directions, like arbitrary directions, but the lattice itself is three dimensional. So there's a space dimensionality. Okay, and. Uh, Okay, and these are important, okay? So the, the space dimension and the spin dimension actually decide whether you can have like uh, transitions or not. And quite often actually the nature of the lattice doesn't matter. So instead of a square lattice, if you have a triangular lattice uh, or some other lattice, it uh, may not matter. What matters is just the dimension and the uh, uh, dimension of the spin. Okay, so. Uh, Depending on this dimension, two dimensions, such systems could undergo uh, ordering transition, uh, which is a uh, uh,
These are, uh, this is a second order transition. So, so this is a, 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 a second order function and happens only in the thermodynamic limit. So is this clear that in, uh, if for a finite system you can never have a transition, right? Okay, so why do real systems, ha real systems are typically finite, right? Why do they show, All right, yeah. So it's basically a question of time scale. I mean, uh, in principle, if you wait, if you take a magnet and wait long enough, it will go to a, a minus state. But that takes so long that you basically see uh, see it in a broken symmetry. <coughs> okay. Sorry. I mean, okay. So nucleation is usually is like second, uh, first order thing. I mean, uh, here, okay. Uh, I mean, I'll talk of fluctuations uh, uh, later. But and fluctuations are important in second order transition. I'll talk about that, but you know, what is your question? Sorry? No, I mean, uh, see, if you take a magnet, I mean, uh, fluctuations means it, like if you look at it, it has some free energy landscape, and it's in this thing, and the it has, there has to be a fluctuation which takes, like this is a huge fluctuation, right? All the spins have to, uh, I mean, around the critical point, of course, the, I mean, anyway, the magnetization is zero. Right, at the critical point is zero. Right, okay, so let me actually draw the, uh, okay, so I said there's an ordering transition, and uh, so th you can identify an order parameter, which is just the magnetization, okay. So corresponding to this ordering transition, uh, uh, so transition, We'll just call as the uh, the magnetization. So if we, if it's a translational invariant system, then uh, it doesn't depend on which site you look at. You will get the same magnetization at each site. And uh, then uh, so what happens is as you change the temperature, it's either zero or it gets a finite value. Okay. And uh, the fact that you get a finite value means that the symmetry of the system is broken because uh, I, I, the Hamiltonian said that you can plus and m and minus m are equally likely, but you find that the system goes to one of the states. Right? So that's, that's the symmetry. Okay, and then uh, we said that, uh, let's see. Uh, okay, so the other thing that, uh, that is kind of uh, some notation that's uh, good to remember is that I mean, all these spin systems usually have a uh, two, uh, something called a lower critical dimension. And an upper critical dimension. So this one is basically, the definition is that below, if you're below the, if you're in very low dimensions, then you can't have phase transitions, okay. So, but this depends on the uh, n value, okay, the uh, spin dimensions n. So for a given n, uh, th there's a dimension below which there are no, uh, you can't have a phase transition. So for Ising model, uh, you, you know, right, so n, uh, n equal to one is Ising model. So there, what is, in what dimensions can you have a phase transition? Huh? Two, okay. So, uh, so there the lower critical dimension is, okay, I don't know about, like, you, have, you can talk of 1.5 also. Uh, okay, I'm not sure what I mean here, but uh, at least, okay, so one is the lower critical dimension. So below, I mean, or one plus delta. So below that, you, you don't have phase transitions, and above two, you have phase transitions. For n equal to two, uh, or let's say, yeah, n equal to two, do you know what, like, so n equal to two is what model? 
x y model. So, x y model in one dimension does it have a phase branch? No. So, in one dimension actually any short range model does not have a phase branch. What about 2 D does it have a phase branch? Huh? X y model. Okay, x y model actually does have a phase transition, but it is not a, it is not an ordering transition. It is something called the costelis Thaulers transition. So, that it is not an ordering transition. So, the you, you do not get a spontaneous magnetization, but you get uh, there is still some other signatures of a transition, but it is not as uh, like ordering transition. Okay, so x y model in three dimensions will give you a transition. Okay, so similarly. So there, okay. So the other thing I'll talk about is in transition. Uh, when you look at uh, phase transitions, you should also it develops long-range uh, correlation, like spins. Like spins are fluctuating here. The fluctuations, I mean, uh, affect fluctu uh, the spin at other sides. So what is the correlation between fluctuations? If you look at that, then typically you find that near the critical point you have like uh, uh, the correlations become uh, long-ranged. And X Y model is something where you have like long range correlations below T C and above T C you have short range correlations. But that I'll discuss when we discuss correlations. Okay, so I still I have not discussed correlation, uh, but that's a different kind of transition. Okay, so this is uh, uh, so as you go to higher n, you need higher dimensions in general to get a phase transition. So that's uh, yeah. So uh, this is small. Again. And uh, this one is uh, dimension. So this is definition. So I'll, uh, so in this lecture what I will try to uh, also illustrate is how do you estimate this critical dimension. So there is something called a Greensburg criteria and we will try to see what, how you get that criteria. Okay, so now we looked at the order parameter for Ising, let us say now Ising model. And we said that uh, if you look at the magnetization as a function of uh, temperature. Uh, then it looks like uh, like that, and so this is uh, some temperature T C. Okay, so uh, I mean this curve in general will depend on details of the system, but lot of properties near this point are kind of universal. Okay. Okay, so for Ising model, it's uh, four. I mean above four dimension, it's supposed to be exact. Sorry. So, we, when we derive, okay, we will derive only for the Ising model, so, but it is easy to extrude, ex, uh, extend it to uh, 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 any model. Uh, right, okay, so, okay, so basically, uh, I mean, uh, this part is non universal. part is the universal property. And by this what I mean is that, uh, for example, if you take the Ising model and change does not depend on J. On form of J as long as it is short range or on lattice and so on. So then in that sense it is universal because there are some things which are uh, like independent of the system. So and uh, so we will be focusing actually just in on this region okay, things near the uh, near the transition point. Okay, and uh, ok 
So some of the things we want to look at near the transition that is commonly uh, studied in the critical phenomena is, for example, like as I approach this point, how does the bank transition uh, vanish? Okay. So that will go like uh, m goes as uh, some c, c minus c to the power beta. Okay. So is, uh, I mean it vanishes in a singular way, and there's a exponent beta. So this is t less than t c, right? And uh, beta is called is a is one example of a critical exponent. And then you can define other exponents, like if you look at the susceptibility, uh, which is size, uh, so that is response of magnetization to a magnetic field. So that also goes as some uh, one by, uh, so this one uh, diverges when you come from either side, okay. So there you can measure the susceptibility here. Uh, and as you approach that is uh, critical point, you'll find that the diver, uh, uh, susceptibility diverges, and even from this side it diverges. So that's why I have a mod here, and there's some exponent uh, which is called, uh, so they have fixed names. Okay, so the uh, beta and so on. Uh, does anyone know what this? Huh? Gamma. Sure. Is it gamma? Uh, no, I don't think. It's Everyone thinks it's gamma, is it? Huh? Yeah, what, what is good? Uh, okay, so uh, susceptibility is gamma, that's right, actually. Is gamma, uh, and then you can look at okay. So this is uh, uh, susceptibility, uh, but you measure it at zero field. Okay, so you look at the response, but in zero field, and then you can look at uh, specific heat. And then you can uh, so if you are exactly at t equal to T C, what is the magnetization? Zero, right? But if you put a small field, you will get a magnetization, and then what the dependence on uh, the uh, of the magnetization on the uh, magnetic field will be again some power, which is uh, okay. So uh, so these are uh, you get four exponents: alpha, beta, gamma, delta, uh, and then there's one more uh, sort of important exponent. And that is to do with correlations. Okay. So the one thing that you remember is that when you have a diverging susceptibility, uh, it also implies that uh, things are their long range correlations. Okay. So why? Can someone say why? Do, why do you? I mean, is that obvious that uh, diverging susceptibility means a long range correlation? Uh, right, yeah. So basically, what you can also show, which okay, we'll go through it. But chi is basically related to uh, is related to uh, uh, fluctuations of the total magnetization. Okay. So it's related to something like m square average minus square. Now this magnetization is uh, summation sigma i. Right. If you take square, you can see you'll get correlations. So we'll actually relate it to spin-spin correlations. Okay, so basically this thing diverging means uh, it relates to divergence of, uh, it implies long-range correlations between the spins. So therefore, uh, one defines a spin-spin correlation. So let's say uh, sigma x bar uh, 
सिग्मा एट जीरो इज इक्वल टू सम कोरिलेशन फंक्शन सी ऑफ एक्स वन ओके एंड देन व्हाट यू सी इज दैट सी ऑफ आई मीन दिस इज ऑफ कोर्स इन लाइक जस्ट डिपेंड्स ऑन द डिस्टेंस सो सी ऑफ एक्स वन गोज एज वन बाय D minus T plus okay. so so you have a, again for all log correlations and it's long range in uh, in the sense that it will uh, so the chi is related to integral of this okay. so that's why uh, chi diverging means that this has to be a long range thing otherwise the integral will be finite so you can just show that chi is actually so therefore you need uh, this to be long range in order to this integral to diverge okay so uh, so typically you find that uh, at the critical point it looks like this if you are slightly away from the critical point you get e to the power minus r by you know some correlation length okay. and this correlation length uh, also diverges when you come uh, you, when you are at tc that, that has to happen because if it is finite then this integral would be finite right so therefore as you approach tc this has to become infinite so therefore this becomes one so you get long range correlation so if you have exponential correlations it means it's short range but uh, at tc this becomes infinite and so this also uh, uh, becomes infinite in a certain way as you approach tc and then you can again write some power so it's uh, 1 by t to the power uh, so alpha gives you the time delta uh, is same as in u right so this is the uh final exponent uh and uh all right yeah okay so and then there are some relations between this uh, very various exponents and all which come from scaling theory and all that which you will probably learn in the next week uh, but what we'll do now is basically try to calculate all these exponents using mean field theory so that's the plan now okay any questions right yeah i mean see if you have uh, for example if you have nearest neighbor uh, so if you have nearest neighbor interactions on a 2d lattice what is that sum and say so supposing all interactions are the same value what is the value of the sum no i'm saying if you have just nearest neighbor interactions on a 2d lattice Yeah. Then what is that sum? It's just four J. Right. So that is easy to evaluate. And if you know how it falls with distance, or you can say even if it's next nearest neighbor, it will be some finite thing. But if you if you make it like it decays very slowly with distance, then you will get some. It might become infinite. Right. You can always imagine some power, but you can always do the integral. Right. Okay, so now let's go back to the our calculation that we started yesterday, which is uh, doing in field theory. Okay, so we said that. Uh, okay, so we're looking at Ising model uh, minus. Okay, so uh, I mean, I've not said anything about dimensions or the form of JIG, right? So it's only thing I've said is translationally invariant, 
and uh, it's short range. That's the only thing I've said. Otherwise, it can be quite generic. And uh, okay, so let's imagine that sigma i's are plus minus one because uh, sigma square is one, so it has to be plus minus one. Uh, okay, and uh, uh, then we said that uh, we have a free energy of the system which is less than or equal to some variational free energy. Uh, which uh, was defined by some uh, uh, by some parameter h of n, and uh, so we took a trial free uh, trial Hamiltonian, which is minus and then we computed this object. So phi was. is clear right to everyone what what is being done uh, right yeah that's an important point uh, okay so in the sense we are restricting means I mean see right now I mean uh, I tried some uh, trial Hamiltonian which was I mean I kind of uh, know what to expect right so I tried this okay. but if you have an anti ferromagnet then this would not work so in that case, what would one use? Huh? Right, yeah. So I mean, uh, yeah. So in that case, I would have to try a different trial Hamiltonian okay? because I kind of know what to expect because the kind of ordering I expect depends on the Hamiltonian. So if you have an anti ferromagnet, uh, the ordered state, if, you, if it's a ferromagnet, the ordered state is all up. Okay, ordered state means how do you, uh, I mean, how do you know what is going to be the ordered state? Okay, so the simplest thing is to look at the ground state. So the ground state, if all the j's are positive, then the ground state is obviously all spins up, right? But supposing uh, j is negative, okay, and it's just nearest neighbor interactions, okay, then the ground state can be like uh, up, it will be up, down, up, down. Okay, so I hope that's clear. I mean, uh, so basically, if you take let's say one d lattice, uh, and you have just interactions between uh, nearest neighbors. So this is what the general Hamiltonian is, right? Sigma i, sigma i plus one. So let's say in a 1D system with nearest neighbor interaction, so j i j is non-zero only if uh, j is i plus minus one, then this is the Hamiltonian. If j is positive, it's easy to see that this is the ground, I mean the lowest energy state. This one and this one. Okay, so they are the two lowest energy states. Okay. And then you expect that at low temperatures it should go into either of this. Okay, so then the ordering transition will be into a state with mag uh, like magnetization uh, either one or minus, or like positive or negative. So, uh, but if, it, if J is negative, then what is the ground state? Alternately up and down, right? Okay, so uh, if J is negative, then uh, this is the lowest state, okay. So then what we expect is that uh, the when we look calculate the magnetization, it should go into a state where also you see a similar feature, like up, down, up, down, up, down, right? So then you should try a corresponding trial magnetic, uh, like uh, this uh, field, okay. So what would you try? It's just a staggered thing, okay, so you'd put on uh, let's say even lattices you'd put a up field. So there will be two variational parameters, H up and uh, let's say, uh, okay, so maybe this is uh, homework. I mean, it's a very nice exercise to do, okay, that I mean, see if you, I mean, uh, you only understand when you calculate, okay, if you don't calculate, you don't understand. That's a basic point, so you should try anti magnet. So consider H equals to uh, J okay so this is a uh, uh, Hamiltonian in any dimension uh, I'm saying J is greater than zero so sign is positive and IJ means just nearest neighbor uh, neighbors are summed over okay. uh, so this notation means just nearest neighbor sum over nearest neighbor so so I'm not putting a j i j, I'm just putting a constant j and I'm saying it's a sum over nearest neighbor. 
So for this, this Hamiltonian, uh, so what I'm saying is that the trial Hamiltonian should be like uh, maybe something like uh, H A. Okay, so now there are two uh, variational fields, okay, and this field acts only on like uh, half the uh, alternate uh, lattice points. So if I have a 2D lattice, okay, so this is, I'm also assuming it's a bipartite system, like I can divide the lattice into two parts, right, I mean, so th uh, these points I will call A, belonging to la sub lattice A, and these guys belong to sub lattice B. So uh, if spins belong to sublattice A, they see some field, and if they belong to sublattice B, they see a different field. Okay. So now with this, uh, I mean H naught, I can still do all these calculations. Okay, they are still non-interacting, right? So it's not hard to do the calculation. So if you do the calculation uh, and then minimize with respect to H A and H B, again you'll get some phase diagram and critical properties, and uh, you, there are a lot of new features you will see for the anti-ferromagnetic model which you don't see for the ferromagnet. So this is a good thing, at least try to work out the equations. Okay, so that uh, maybe, uh, okay, so maybe in the tutorial, uh, you guys will sit and work through this. And then at the end of the tutorial, we'll uh, see if it's okay. Okay, so, okay, but right now we are assuming, let's assume uh, ferromagnetic Okay, so then we calculated this various parts. So uh, if uh, it's not was just uh, so each average. Uh, of this, okay, and then we also put a field. We also had an external magnetic field. So this is a real magnetic field. So this we said is minus. Uh,
and then uh, you, you just take derivative with this. I mean, we have to minimize this uh, with respect to HM. So uh, we take del phi by. So that will find the value of HM uh, at which uh, this is minimized. So that's the optimal uh, optimal value of HM, which uh, gives the uh, biggest possible bound for A. Okay. So if you do this, uh, what do you get? Uh, so what is this derivative? Which you take? Uh, it's just 10. And this will give uh, minus. Uh, and uh, from here you get minus and finally this term gives uh, they both uh, so uh, uh, this is also dependent on H HM, right? So we have to write two terms. So one term is plus uh, M, and the other term is So this is equal to zero, and uh, now we know that uh, M satisfies this equation. So therefore, this cancels with this, and uh, we are left with uh, so something. This is common del M by del H M, and inside what you have is uh, gives you H of M equals to. So this is uh, okay. So now we have two equations. Uh, this one. And the other equation is the uh, m equal to tan height by dv. Yeah. And uh, so this uh, two equations will determine, uh, can uh, you can solve them to determine m, right? So I mean, this equation, if you just put hm, use this. So this equation, I guess all of you have probably seen already. Uh, maybe at, at least many of you must have seen. This is the, okay, so now we have to, for a, any temperature, given a temperature and a magnetic field, uh, this equation determines your ma magnetization, right? So, okay, so the interesting thing is that even if you put H equal to zero, okay, if, so, uh, if you put H equal to zero, you get M equal to, Okay, so now what? Uh, so will this give a finite magnetization? Huh? Yeah, depending on yes. Yeah, so how will we determine whether uh, yes? Yeah, so I mean, uh, we can't solve this equation, right? And so the simplest way to is to just plot it graphically. Uh, so if you plot the two functions uh, uh, here, then uh, tan hyperbolic is a function which goes to uh, one at infinity. So it's uh, just like that. And uh, so this, this is what. And now M is of course a line with unit uh, slope, right? So it looks like this. So now we see that, uh, so this is uh, M, and we see that it, uh, th there are three solutions to this equation, right? Okay, so this of course depends on uh, whether this curve could look like this or it could look like, I mean, uh, okay, so now, uh, so the important point is that this curve either it can go up like that or it can go down like that. 
and that will be determined by the slope of this curve at uh, zero, right? So uh, near zero, this pretty much looks like a straight line, right? It just looks like beta j tilde m. So the slope of this, uh, the tan hyperbolic curve is basically beta j tilde, tilde right? So if beta j tilde is uh, greater than one, then you get a transition, right? If it is greater than one, the slope here, then it means it's, uh, the curve is like that. If it is less than one, means tan hyperbolic looks like that. Okay, so I'm not good at drawing. Uh, and uh, so this is, Slope is greater than one, right? And this curve corresponds to. Okay, so in this case, there's only one solution. So like m equal to this case has only one solution, which is zero. So for this, there's only one solution, uh, and for this, there are three solutions. Okay, so now, I mean, uh, in principle, you can solve this. Like you can just put it on a computer and solve this equation and plot m as t as a function of temperature. And of course, you'll get, uh, if you, okay, so now, uh, so what is TC now? So it, this gives us TC immediately, right? So TC is basically beta j tilde is equal to one. So beta Cj implies uh, Tc equal to J tilde. Okay, so basically the uh, temperature, I mean, so if you want dimensions, then if you put this as energy, you should put a Kb here, right, for a Boltzmann constant. But it basically the uh, typical transition temperature is kind of proportional to whatever uh, microscopic energy scale that you put. Okay, so we have the tra transition, so above Tc equal to, uh, above the Tc, uh, M equals to zero. And uh, below Tc, m is uh, so mod m because either it can go to minus magnetization or plus. So if you solve this equation numerically on a computer, you'll find get a curve like this. And now let's just try to, like we are just interested in the exponents, right, near this point. So Tc equal to j tilde. So now we'll just uh, blow up this region and try to find at least, uh, so one exponent we want is like how does uh, I mean this thing go to zero, right? So we'll try to find that exponent first uh, in this mean field calculation. Okay, so, uh, so to do that, uh, we, it's, uh, it's easy because uh, it's, see, for small m, uh, we are looking at the magnetization is small, right? So at least we know the value of magnetization is small. So then you can just do a Taylor expansion of this. So then uh, this gives us m equal to beta j tilde m. That's the first term. And then we also have to keep the next term. What is the next term? Uh, if you expand tan hyperbolic x, huh? X cubed by three, right? So you get beta j tilde uh, two minus three. Okay, so now, okay, so m equal to zero is one solution. You, you take it out, so you get uh, one uh, beta j tilde minus one is equal to. And you also know that. This beta j tilde is close to one, right? So you can just put one. Okay, so you get then m square is equal to three. Uh, so this is uh, basically j tilde is tc, right? So this is uh, tc uh, by two minus one. Okay, so it's here. Uh, it's better to put. Uh, and uh, then, uh, so we are interested not in all this uh, prefactor, right? We are just interested in the exponent. So here you immediately see that this is given by Tc minus 3 to the power half. 
Okay, so we have calculated the first exponent. Uh, we said the magnetization goes as uh, uh, t uh, t to the power half. Okay, so this t, let's define it as t. So the sign is important. So, we'll, so magnetization is zero, of course, only for t uh, less than t. Okay, so, we'll, uh, so this goes as t to the power half. So this gives us beta equals to half. Okay, so Okay, then let's try to find uh, this object uh, m goes as x to the power delta. Okay, so we have to then keep the magnetic field uh, and uh, expand this equation. Uh, so again, these things are small, right? So we, again, we can do a Taylor expansion. And so I won't do the full details, but basically if you do the Taylor expansion, you get something like beta. This is exactly at t equal to dt. Okay, so you write this plus h plus uh, Okay, so and then uh, you basically uh, expand this thing and keep terms till order uh, h. Okay, so. Uh, this gives you beta is equals to, and if you expand this, first term is let's say beta j till 1 till 3 k, and then the next term is uh, this square into this thing, so that is uh, square into h, and there's a 3 which cancels with this 3, and then, okay, and there's a m square. And then there are terms which are m square into h square, right? But okay, but here you should uh, since m you know is going to be small, so you should keep terms till uh, like order h. Okay. Uh, so when you do this kind of calculations, I mean even when you do random walks, it's important that uh, you make sure that you keep terms correctly to all orders. Okay. So one thing is to keep all terms after you, and at the end of your calculation. Just put it back and make sure that you didn't neglect terms which were uh, which were actually of uh, of relevant order. Okay, so right now I'm saying you can ignore the other terms and just solve this. Okay, so now uh, next what we'll do is we'll be at exactly t equal to tc, uh, in which case uh, m is zero. Sorry. So you have to uh, go to h equal to uh, uh, zero, I, uh, uh, t equal to tc, uh, in which case uh, these two will cancel, right? Beta, because we said beta j tilde is one at t equal to tc, so this and this cancels. And uh, then the uh, leading term is actually just uh, this two term. Okay. So at Get uh, h equals to one two. So this, uh, so we have defined this other exponent as uh, h to the power one by delta. That was the second exponent. So in this case, delta is equal to three. Okay. So actually, we didn't need this term. Now you can go back and like if you 
put h as one by delta, you can check that this is smaller than this. So that it was okay to neglect this. Okay, so uh, so we have got two exponents, and then we can get two more, which are the. Uh, so if we want to find del m h uh, so okay, so first we have to put a field and find this derivative so uh, this if you just do the calculation you'll find that this is given by beta Basically, you just have to take derivatives, and when you take derivative, you have to remember that there's an m here also. So you have to bring things this side, and uh, then uh, use the fact that m is equal to this, then you get 1 minus m square. So this you should, I won't do all the details. And this is, is uh, just uh, algebra. Okay, now uh, if you look at this object, then what you find is, uh, if you now put h equal to 0, Then uh, you get that t uh, greater than t c. So for t greater than t c, of course, m is zero, right? So then you immediately get uh, uh, chi goes as uh, beta by one minus. Okay, so this is uh, basically goes as uh, so this is uh, what t c by t. So that is one by. So I mean I'm not writing prefactors. Okay, so I'm just interested in this part. So the, again, you see that it diverges as uh, with a power one. Okay, now you can also do t less than t c. In which case you have to be a bit careful that uh, I mean so you I mean even though m is small, you can't simply put it equal to zero. Okay, so then you'd get of course the same dependence, right? So there you have to uh, at small. Uh, T minus T C, you know the expansion of M square, which we did somewhere. And uh, if you put that, uh, then basically what you get is, uh, okay, so we yeah, use M square is Okay, so you have to use the fact that M square is, uh, I mean, like this. And then you put it in here, and what you'll get is uh, okay. Maybe it's uh, I just put the factor also. So, so again, you get one by t c minus t, uh, but there's a factor which is different. Okay, so here you can put a, a plus and b is minus. So I won't do the calculation, but these factors are different. Okay, so they have the they diverge with the same power law, but the prefactor is different in uh, above t c and below t c. Okay, so that's the susceptibility, and finally, uh, so this means uh, this exponent we called what uh, chi was. Gamma. Okay, so gamma is uh, one. That's the third exponent, and finally, specific heat is just uh, uh, so specific heat. Okay, so the energy is given by just H expectation, uh, right? That's the energy, uh, uh, but with this trial Hamiltonian, and this is uh, given by uh, minus uh, J two by T M square. 
Okay, so this is the energy and specifically there's just uh, derivative of this. So this is equal to uh, minus k q bar v. And then again, you have to do a similar calculation uh, like this. And uh, uh, so I'll just again write the final result. So in this case, you find that you don't get a divergence. Okay. So the only thing if, uh, okay, so, uh, so I'll just write the expression that you get finally, uh, the exact expression that you get. Okay, and then again, if you are greater than, okay, so the, if you're greater than TC, it's very easy, right? You just put M equal to zero. If you put M equal to zero, what do you get? Here, it's very easy, right? It's, you get zero. And if you put M, uh, if you're below TC, then it's not zero, okay? You get some number. Again, you have to be careful, do the calculation using uh, this thing. Uh, if you're close to, uh, like, uh, less than TC, but very close, then you, uh, you can use that approximation and evaluate it. And what you find finally is, uh, uh, okay, so T less than uh, T greater than TC, uh, the specific heat is uh, zero, and uh, less than TC, uh, okay, so the, okay, so you don't get a divergence, you just get a discontinuity in the specific heat, okay, so below and above TC. Uh, okay, I don't know why you get 3 by 2 kb. I mean, uh, 3 by 2 kb is also specific heat of what? Ideal gas, right? Ideal gas specific heat is 3 by 2 kb. I'm not sure why you get uh, uh, this thing here. Uh, I'm not even sure of the free factor. That's what I got. Okay, but you get a different uh, yeah, specific heat. And so in this case, uh, uh, the expected behavior, like in, uh, if you really, if you know the exact result or if you look at uh, experiments, what is expected is that it should also uh, diverge uh, with a power uh, alpha. Uh, but this you don't get from this mean field calculation. Uh, you, uh, so it's like alpha is zero roughly. Okay. Actually, uh, in real systems, alpha is really very small. Okay. So that's why mean field is not able to get it. Uh, okay. So these are the uh, some of the exponents, and then now we'll okay, uh, we'll probably look at uh, the correlations in the next class. In uh, here, uh, I'll discuss some other features of this uh, free energy. Any questions? Okay, so the other thing I wanted to say is that uh, if you look at the free energy, uh, per unit uh, volume, uh, then it we had this thing, uh, so minus, So this uh, HM is of course tan hyperbolic inverse of M, right? But you can also write tan hyperbolic inverse in this nice form. So that's just doing some uh, algebra. So 
So this, if you have not done it, again, I'll say just make sure that you get this. Uh, and the other thing is from here, it follows that uh, cos hyperbolic So now, I mean, the, this is a, I mean, a variational field, but I can, I can write every, it in completely in terms of m, right? Instead of hm, I just want to write it in terms of the order parameter. Okay. So then what I get is like phi of m, I just still call it phi of m, it's a different function, but I uh, just call it phi of m. And uh, so this function is uh, basically given by, uh, so this term is, let's say, minus two tilde m squared and so, and then uh, if I put everything together, at the end of the day, what, uh, what you'll get is, Okay, so somehow you'll get this. Okay, so again, you should do the yeah, uh, calculation. Okay, actually, if you, I don't know if yesterday, huh? Put the bracket here. Uh, okay, so uh, okay, this one I, I don't know, like. I think Sanjeev gave a problem yesterday on uh, this large deviation function of random walk. Like you gave a homework, you think? Uh, I think it looks very similar. I don't know if there, did anyone do it. I mean, you, then you should get something very similar to this. Okay, uh, okay, uh, okay. So now this is a variational free energy as a function of magnetization, and. Uh, Okay, and now uh, we want to look at this function as it's, as you go across the transition temperature. Okay. So one thing is like if you expand this, then basically like you'll get m squared and m4, right? So in uh, so then uh, if you expand in as, uh, because the finally we are interested in small m, right, near the transition temperature. So we can just expand it around m equal to zero. And then typically what you'll get is something like a, uh, a by two m square first term and so you won't get an odd term and the next term you'll get is like plus let's say u by 4 m4 and then you'll get this minus hm okay and the other thing you'll see is that as you change the temperature the sign of this will change okay so i mean so that is uh, uh, i mean this is what is known as the lambda of free energy uh, without fluctuation so that we see, we can also get it from this variational treatment. Okay, now let's just uh, plot this function as you ch change temperature. Okay. So if you uh, look at this function, basically it looks like this. If you are uh, above Pc, if you are above Pc, then uh, this function just has the You are below TC. And if you are exactly at TC, then it looks like. very flat function. Okay, so, uh, so it makes sense because, uh, so at TC, I mean, you just sit at the minima, 
at like if you are greater than tc if you are less than tc you either go to this class 2 uh, values of uh, magnetization and uh, at tc you can see that uh, you expect very like uh, it's very flat so even though it's average zero but you expect that there will be big fluctuation so this is for h equal to zero right so if you put on a field of course uh, you can guess what will happen right uh, so what will happen here? It will just shift. There will still be one minima. So if h is uh, greater than zero, I mean this will, I guess, look like uh, if it's positive field, you expect a positive magnetization. So the minima should be somewhere here. Uh, and if it is uh, uh, below Tc, uh, then uh, like one of the minima goes down, the other goes up. So you get uh, something like that. Uh, and at TC, okay, it will uh, look something. Uh, okay, so okay, so now let's go to fluctuations, uh, and uh, so let's see how we can calculate fluctuations again using mean field theory. Any? Ah, yeah, you know, N is like we are just doing Ising model. Uh, where did that go in? Because uh, uh, I mean, I didn't, didn't put vectors and all, right? I just put a single scalar quantity magnetization. So N is equal to one, and dimensions is anything. So one thing you can see immediately is that it, uh, it, it, does, it doesn't tell you, it tells you that even in 1D you can get a transition, which is wrong, right? So that way it uh, gets things wrong. Uh, yeah, so this is completely independent of dimension. I mean, I didn't say anything about dimension. I didn't say anything about the inter party. I mean, J tilde basically said like uh, is equal to the range of interactions and everything is contained in this J tilde. I mean, uh, how many neighbors I want to in, uh, include and so on. Everything is included in this J tilde. Okay. Uh, Okay, so how, uh, I mean, how do we calculate, okay, so what is fluctuations first of all? I mean, fluctuations basically means like if you take a, uh, okay, so you have uh, uh, strings uh, sitting on a lattice and you know that, uh, I mean, let's say if you are, uh, So uh, you are at some temperature, and uh, let's say you have uh, like in out here, maybe most of the strings are up, so you are below Tc, and uh, you have some net magnetization or something, right? But this is a system in uh, like in equilibrium, which means that it's always fluctuating, right? I mean, even uh, it doesn't like it's not like the strings just stay like that, right? They keep flipping, but on an average, uh, they are like uh, most of them are up. So there's always fl spontaneous fluctuations because of thermal, because it's in a thermal gear. Uh, so, I mean, the distribution of, I mean, is still given by this. The probability that if you look uh, in time, if you just observe the system, the probability you will find it in a given microstate is basically this weight, right, by Z. So it keeps fluctuating, like in time, if you look at in a given spin, you'll see, like in the entire configuration, you'll see it's fluctuating over different configurations. Uh, and on an average, the weight of each configuration is this, right? So, if you, if you just focus on one spin, you'll find it's uh, like there's uh, fluctuations all the time. Now, uh, uh, so what we want to look at is like how 
uh, are the fluctuations here correlated to fluctuations out here, right? There are obviously some correlation because like if this goes up, this also wants to go uh, up and so on, right? So obviously they are correlated. Uh, we want to see how far does this correlation go, right? So that given by this correlation function, and so this I already defined, uh, so this correlation function C of x bar is let's say spin spin correlations and uh, so the because I said the system is translationally invariant, if you calculate correlation of this spin, so let's say this is the origin zero bar with some spin x bar uh, which is some distance, then I mean you get the same correlation between this and some other spin like that, right? So it's translationally invariant. So I can just compute this for fix one spin here and with any other spin, so right? So this is just uh, correlation between the spin at the origin and uh, some spin out here uh, minus sigma So now th this quantity is the same everywhere, right? Because there's translation in invariance, so these are both equal to m. If there is a magnetization, it's m. If there's no magnetization, this is zero. So this is just m square, and I can easily write it in this way also, right? So this is like the change in magnetization at a, at point origin. So on an average, there's m, but uh, this is the fluctuation in the magnetization, and this is the fluctuation at some other point, okay? And then I'm seeing how they're correlated. Right? If they're uncorrelated, of course, this is zero. I mean, by definition, if these are uncorrelated objects, then this average is equal to this average, so it's un zero. Otherwise, you'll see some correlation. And we want to compute this. Okay, so now uh, what we can do is uh, to calculate this object. Uh, so how, from the partition function, how do you calculate it? Okay, so does anyone know how, I mean, what? I need to do is, huh? Ah, right, yeah, yeah. So, okay, so, uh, I mean, of course, by definition, I mean, this object means, IJ really means X, X prime, right? Uh, okay, so here, and finally, we'll be interested in uh, correlations for H equal to zero, okay? So right now, I'm not putting any field. Uh, this is what we're interested in, divided by Z. Okay, now, uh, okay, so just computing this directly is kind of difficult. So, I mean, uh, okay, you can do it, but it's, uh, yeah. so one trick to calculate this object is to, okay, so first you notice that if you look at uh, sigma x bar, then that's actually just given by minus, uh, so let's define an, uh, uh, a new partition function with uh, some fields at each side. So H is the this Hamiltonian, and then you also put a magnetic field uh, H of x bar at, at all sides. Okay, now if you take, let's say, del del h x bar of log z, then what do you get? So the magnetic field occurs only here, right? Other than that, it's just sum over spins and so on. So if you take a derivative with respect to uh, this, what you get, you'll get, of course, 1 by z, uh, del z by h x x bar. So this is what? 
So if you take del del uh, z, this beta times sigma x will come out here. Uh, and so you basically get beta This is clear to everyone. Okay, and uh, so therefore the magnetization uh, is basically given by del uh, del del. del the free energy, right? Uh, if you take one by beta here and put a minus sign, that is the free energy. So this, of course, for uniform fields, you already know. But it's also true if for a, uh, OK, so now if I take another derivative, let's say I take uh, del. Okay, then what do I get? Uh, right, yeah. So this again you can do, and uh, what you'll find is that this just gives you, so it's like taking another derivative here. Uh, then you'll get uh, basically uh, sigma x, sigma x prime, and then minus c. Okay, so uh, this will basically give you Is this okay? Okay, so uh, so basically the correlation, I mean, uh, between spins, like it's basically like if I put a small field at some site x prime and look at the response at some other site x, that basically gives me the correlation function, right? Because I'm just, it's like a response function. So, I mean, in some sense, this measures spontaneous fluctuations, but it also measures like response. So, uh, I mean, either I can look at, so this is like a simple uh, relation between response and correlations. Okay. I mean, uh, right, yeah, with this physically, it makes sense. Okay, so now what we'll do is basically uh, try to, uh, uh, I mean, to calculate this, we'll basically put a uh, small field in the Hamiltonian which depends on x, and then uh, uh, basically uh, use this fact to compute the correlation function. So with the magnetic field, we already know how to use uh, like uh, do mean field theory. Uh, here now we just have to put a magnetic field which depends on space, okay? And then again try to do uh, mean field theory, and uh, uh, so let's now do that. one uh, okay so basically the, like if you look at uh, here I mean uh, if you take one more derivative so one term is like del 2z by del x square right so that will give you sigma x sigma x prime then then the other term is this minus one by this and that will give you sigma x prime. okay so this one I mean it's uh, everything I'm not completing the steps you should just do the steps Let me just uh, outline the steps and then we'll stop. 
Okay, so the other thing I should uh, again uh, repeat is that uh, susceptibility is given by Relation just depends on x bar minus x prime, uh, and this uh, susceptibility is exactly given by this relation. Okay, so uh, now we have to basically do. We have to do mean field theory for this model where uh, the Hamiltonian is given by minus sum over uh, okay, so since we have a field which depends on uh, like uh, sites, so what should be the trial Hamiltonian? So now again we have to just basically try to compute the partition function, we have to guess some trial Hamiltonian. Right, yeah, so now instead of one uh, year, we just put minus uh, sum over eight. I mean, it's still there's no interaction, it's still non interacting, but at each site you have a uh, like a mean field, which is different. Uh, and then, of course, you can do the everything, like uh, because it's non interacting, you can still compute everything. And finally, what you get is, uh, is basically a free energy which looks like this, phi equal to. Now I can't put m square because they depend on uh, sites. Okay, so this is the this comes just from this term, uh, where m x. Uh, so I'll write what are m x. So m x dot is now what? That's with the x bar. So there are as many variational parameters now as the number of sites. Okay, so and at each site I have this relation. Uh, and then I, uh, so the next, uh, the energy is just, Okay, so now uh, basically we have this uh, set of equations. Uh, so this is the, uh, this is not per unit size, this is the full thing. And where m x bar is given by this. Okay, and this one again, uh, I can write it entirely in terms of just uh, m x. Uh, in this case, it looks like this. Okay, 
Maybe I won't write. Yeah. Okay, so now what we have to do is basically uh, take this and again do this variational stuff. So, I mean, you can guess like what kind of equation I will get, right? I mean, like uh, what will be the variational field now? Uh, so, if we do del phi, phi del h x uh, bar equal to zero, uh, obviously, the, uh, I mean, uh, no, uh, if you just do it, it's easy to see that you will, what we'll get is h n x bar is equal to, uh, now there's no j tilde, but it's, it's different at each side. So I guess we'll get, uh, Uh, the variational, I mean, this is the uh, mean field that you get at each, uh, each site x. Okay, so earlier we had got h, uh, uh, h at any site is equal to j tilde m plus h. Right? Now it's different at each site and it's given by this. And we have this equation plus uh, this equation which completely determines uh, all this m is and uh, mean field. Okay, so, uh, but what we are interested in is basically trying to use this to evaluate the, uh, the correlation function uh, at some point. So, these equations are valid at any temperature and anywhere uh, in the, uh, any magnetic field and any temperature, right? which are completely exact within mean field theory. But now we'll try to solve this in this region uh, and try to ex extract the correlation function uh, at uh, at zero magnetic field, okay. and see if we get really get uh, like long range correlation. Uh, okay, so I guess we'll do it in the next class. Theta square. Chi, okay, so chi is by definition is what uh, del uh, this is correct, right? Uh, because if you take del m del h, you'll get a beta and then you'll get m square minus m. This is correct, right? I think this is correct. Uh, okay, no, this is okay. You have to be, uh, okay. Maybe I made a mistake somewhere. I think it's correct. But I'm saying just like from here, if you see, this is definitely correct. Right? Because, I mean, if you just remember what is M, M is uh, average, uh, the whatever, sum over sigmas into it to the minus beta h uh, minus h of m. But this is m. Sorry, not m, but let's say sum over sigma. This is the expected value of this object. Right? By z is the. Okay, now if I take, uh, if I take del m by del h, then from here I'll get a beta and I'll get uh, m square. Right? So I certainly get this. Now it's clear that m square is this object. Okay? So why is that true? Because, uh, I mean, is it clear that this should be this? Huh? I mean, it's basically, I mean, uh, m square. M is sum over sigma x, so m square minus m average square So this is sum over both x and x prime. Okay, 
Now, if we, uh, we know this system has translational invariance, so this depends just on sigma x bar minus x prime. And this is anyway constant, right? So this is m square. Okay, so, uh, okay, so now we still have two sums. So we can easily do one sum, which will just give the number of lattice sites. So that is n sum over x bar, and this is just the correlation function, right? So p to the p of x bar. Okay, so there's a uh, depends on the n. So if we divide by the, if we make it intensive, uh, I mean, if we uh, per unit, uh, it's not simply per unit volume, then uh, we basically get uh, this relation. So this is certainly definitely correct. Uh, okay, this one I'm not sure. I mean, I, you have to just see if this beta is there or maybe it's one by beta. Okay. I think it's correct. I mean, you have to just make sure it. Uh, 